the idea of baggage, I thought, well, I need to come with some kind of joke about baggage. And, and I, I, I did play a lot, but I did hear a story about a guy that had some gifts and supplies that he wanted to ship off to some friends of his, friends and family. And uh, he had, they had three different destinations. He went to find out how much it would cost to ship it. And it was going to be really expensive. So he had an idea because he was flying in the next couple of weeks. So he just took it with him to the airline. And when he checked in, he set up all three bags on the counter for the baggage claim. And he just told the lady behind the counter, he says, I'd like this bag to go to Florida. I'd like this one to go to Denver. And I'd like you to send this one to New York. And the lady says, well, you're not flying to any of those places. I can't send your baggage to all those different locations. And the men said, well, why not? You just did it last month. Ain't that the truth? Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> there you go. It's the only baggage joke I know. Uh, in Samuel chapter 8, the Bible says that all the elders of Israel had gathered together and they had come to Samuel, who was their prophet. Uh, he had been operating as a judge over the nation. And they meet him at Ramah. And in verse 5 it says that they said to him, You, know, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. It's an interesting time as the Israelites pretty directly refuse God, and they reject God, and they come up with their old plan of getting a king. The Israelites were tired of the corruption in their system of judicial government that they had. They felt constantly threatened by the military strength of neighboring nations. And so all the elders of the Jews were just tired of, of the way things were, the way things were going, and they kind of wanted to take charge of these things. And they go to Samuel, and, and they tell him, it's time that we have a king. They believe that that's the best approach or the best direction for their nation. So Samuel inquires of the Lord about this. He says, God, what should I do? And God says, I've heard their cries. Don't worry about it, Samuel. They're not rejecting you, but they're rejecting me. So I'm going to give them their king. And their first king was going to be a guy by the name of Saul. He was the son of Kish from the tribe of Benjamin. And God instructs Samuel to go back to his home and wait there. And he will send Saul to actually meet him at his home. So Saul, Saul waits before uh, before the Lord, and the time uh, and he's waiting for uh, the, for God to bring him the man that he spoke of that, to be made king. And before this, uh, before being made king, Saul is just a guy that's out wandering in the wilderness. He's a young man helping out his father. Because some donkeys had gotten lost, they have gotten out of the pen or whatever, they have gotten loose. And they got, they got away, and so Saul, this young man, he's just wandering out in the desert trying to find these donkeys. Well, they near uh, a, a town on their quest, and Saul's servant remembers hearing about a seer, somebody that can predict things, or somebody that can see things in the supernatural. And so they inquire who this man was, and they're sent to Samuel's house. And Saul walks through the door into Samuel's house, and he's the man that God had appointed to be the king. It's amazing how this kind of happens and gets, gets drawn together as the Lord leads Samuel into the presence, or Saul into the presence of the prophet Samuel, for the purpose of Samuel telling him that he is going to be raised up as a new king over the Israelite nation. So the prophet Samuel has told Saul the news. He anoints him with oil in preparation to become the new king, and then he sends him back home to wait his time. And so Saul does. What an interesting situation. I mean, can you imagine being called out and, and, uh, and you're told, okay, you're going to be the new, we're going to you know, get rid of our current form of government. You will, you will be the new king of America. And uh, you know, that would kind of blow your mind a little bit. I don't know. That's a job I don't think I'd want to have. <laughs> Why would anybody put me the president? I mean, you can't make anybody happy. You can't do anything right. Uh, it's a, what, what an overwhelming job 
And so here Saul is being told, you're going to be the new king. Go home and wait for your appointed time. So I want to go to 1 Samuel chapter 10. And read about the story when he's called out among, out from the people to take his spot, his position as the king. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verses 17 through 22. And the prophet Samuel has gathered all the Israelite nations together. And he has them there, and they know that they've come together to select the new king. And they're going to use a system of lots, um, which is kind of a, a game of chance, if you will, by drawing lots. Uh, they're going to trust God to lead them to the right person. And so Samuel, verse 17, summoned the people of Israel to the Lord at Zithpah. And he said to them, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought Israel up out of Egypt, and I delivered you from the power of Egypt and all the kingdoms that oppressed you. But you have now rejected your God, who saves you out of all your calamities and distresses. And you have said, No, set a king over us. So now present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and clans. Then Samuel brought all the tribes of Israel near. The tribe of Benjamin was chosen. Then he brought forth the tribe of Benjamin, and clan by clan, uh, and Mitri's clan was chosen. Then finally Saul, son of Kish, was chosen. But when they looked for him, he was not to be found. Here's his big day. Here, here's the coronation. I'd be too. Yeah, yeah, right. And that's exactly what he did. And so they inquired further of the Lord. Has the man come here yet? God, where is he? And the Lord said, yes. He is hiding himself among the baggage. And so they've all these plans have traveled together. And they've got some luggage with them. And they've got tents. And they probably have animals and food. And, and all the things that they're going to need. And they're talking about all these people. And so apparently there was some kind of a pile of all the stuff that they needed for the journey. And when they couldn't find Saul to be raised up as a, as a king over the nations, they ask about where is he, and they find him hiding in the baggage. Now, just for fun, I found this on I saw this on Facebook this last week, so some of you may have seen it already. But we'll just see if you can. Uh, you look at this picture, and and uh, can, do, do you notice anything unusual about this? picture of rocks, and I'll give you a minute to look it over. As soon as you see it, you feel like telling your friends what it is, go ahead. If, if they want to know, maybe they want to keep looking. You see it, go down it, go down one, it'll zoom in a bit. Okay, it's getting a little bit more obvious, maybe. See a lot of uh, blank faces still, maybe go down one. We're getting there now. It's funny because when you, once you see it, you can't unsee it, it's pretty amazing. How about one more? Okay, now who sees it? Oh, a few. Wow, really? Okay, still kind of hiding. Mm -hmm. There you go. Um, I should have brought my pointer. Go one more. That red circle is around a man's face. And the white part of the center is a nose and lips. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> He's coming down right there. All right, those are his eyes right above. And, um... And so, so there it is. So bring it back a little bit because it's kind of fun to see it smaller. There, there you go. Maybe you can still see it up in there now. In fact, in fact, I just noticed this morning actually his whole body is there. Yeah. It's all, it's uh, the legs and everything. And it's just so, yeah, there's a whole body. Okay, go ahead and go for it. So that's just kind of fun. But basically, that's kind of like what Saul is doing. He's hidden in the stuff. He's hiding in the baggage. Samuel has announced, anointed, and advertised that Saul is to be the new king of Israel. But Saul, uh, and, Saul to, and so Saul is prepared for this. But here we find him hiding from his opportunity and from his responsibility. And it just seems to beg the question, are you hiding in any baggage? Are you hiding in any baggage? I, I bet that there are times when you find yourself hiding in the baggage of your life. Past experiences and situations. Things that um, have caused
caused you to be the person who you are today? I think most of us do. There's all kinds of baggage that we have. We have fear. We have anger. We have hurts and guilt. We have preferences and disappointments. There's pain. There are many different types of baggage. And perhaps you are hiding behind baggage because just like Saul, or and just like Saul, it's keeping you from becoming the man or the woman of God that he is calling you to be. When we hide behind the baggage of our life, it keeps us from becoming the man or woman of God that he wants us to be. God's calling you to step out. God calls you to, to uh, have faith. God calls you saying, trust me, serve me. I believe he even calls us to do great things for him. But our baggage has us hiding in fear and shame. You know, a moment of transparency for me as I thought about this, and I had, had been thinking about this during the week. I've been reading the text. I've been writing down some notes. And then something happened to me. And I was actually uh, asked, I was invited, um, to begin praying about if I would take a new position of leadership. And this is a bit of a, uh, of a, of a city impacting position of leadership. And, and I said, I had a thought about it. And I said, yeah, I'll pray about it. But my, my first reaction, my first thought was, no way. I don't want the responsibility. I don't want that. I don't want to invest the time. And quite honestly, my fears immediately came up, and I said, "I don't think I'm qualified to do the job." Now, maybe I am. Maybe I'm not. Uh, God needs to. I need to, you know, be before the Lord on this. I need to look at my schedule, so I'm going to be wise. But my first reaction is, I can't do this. I'm not good enough. This isn't for me. And I was hiding behind my baggage. You know, there might be legitimate reasons for me to, uh, to decline the opportunity or to take it. But I can't let my baggage decide. I can't let my baggage determine who I'm going to be, what I'm going to do, and where I'm going to serve the Lord. Listen to the story of one lady who discovered that baggage uh, in her life was holding her back. She writes this, my father was volatile and mentally unstable. Criticism was his preferred method of communication. As a child and teenager, I learned to keep my thoughts and my feelings locked away and became an expert at deflecting any personal questions. Without realizing it, I carried this habit into adulthood, avoiding any talk about my feelings or turning them just into a joke. When a friend called me on it, the shock of self-recognition quickly turned into resistance. You know how that happens, right? Oh, there's nothing wrong with me. This is who I am, I thought. Why should I change? I plodded on, working as hard as ever to keep my fortress intact. It wasn't making me happy, yet I still wasn't ready to change. I struggled with my desire to cling to hurtful memories and self-defeating behaviors. And it dawned on me that I was afraid to let go because defensiveness was part of my identity. Isn't that interesting how she described it? That her baggage had become her identity. She saw herself and only could see herself as a person of fear and of hurts and of pains and frustration and her baggage became who she was. Have you ever felt that way? Or maybe other people see you that way. You're shy or you're angry. You have jealous tendencies or maybe you're just cocky and chauvinistic. Maybe you're abrasive or maybe you live exhausted all the time. But you find yourself saying, well, that's just the way that I am. That's just who I am. Or maybe that's the way others would describe Oh, yeah, well, that's just so-and-so. That's just the way. And your identity is determined by your baggage. Saul was nobody special up until this point. A simple, private, young man out in the field looking for the donkeys. 
suddenly he's shown in the limelight and he's called to be made a king of a nation. What a huge responsibility. I mean, where did that come from? Why should he be chosen? What qualifies him for the job? What experience did he have that says he could do it? The answer in this case is simply that he was able because God had called him to do the job. He could have done it if he would have trusted in the Lord for what he needed. He could have been enough if he had trusted God, but he had no identity in God. Instead, Saul thought of himself as weak and unprepared and unable, and so he is hiding behind his baggage, and he is determining course of his life and who he is by the way he saw himself, not in God, but in his weakness. Are you hiding behind any baggage? Over the next few weeks, we'll try to unpack some of this. I'm asking you to be really great and think through some of these things. We'll give a little bit of a process here later on. But what are the things that hold you back in your life? Simply, all, what, all I want to really say today is as we consider this, I'd like to ask you this second question. Will you let God call you out from behind the baggage? Apparently, somehow, some way, Saul gets up and he walks out. Now, probably because there's a million Israelites standing around and dragging him, calling and shouting and chanting and, you know, hey, we want our king, we want our king. But see, so he moves out. And it's interesting, I think we get a further glimpse into the problem here by recognizing what happens along the way. Because the question before you is, will you let God call you out of the baggage? In verse 23, it says, they ran and brought him out. Apparently, he really didn't go willingly. I can see him grabbing stuff. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I'm staying here. He's like diving and digging deeper into the pile. And they're got him by the foot. And they're, they're coming with us. Buddy. They brought him out. And as he stood among the people, he was a head taller than any of the others. Samuel said to all the people, Do you see the man the Lord has chosen? There is no one like him among all the people. And then the people shouted, Long live the king. What is interesting about this, these verses, this portion, is we recognize what the people saw that made them so excited to have their new king. He was a tall man, standing head and shoulders above anybody else. Here's a guy who didn't need to stand on a platform. He walked through the crowd and you could still see him above everyone. He was a man of stature. He was a man of presence. Ever be around a tall person, a big person? You just, you just get this feeling right away. Okay, here, here, is, here is a man. He was a man of presence. Earlier in the verse, we didn't read this part, but it talks about how impressive he was. Even Samuel was smitten with this man when he first saw him. Oh, what a, he, he's good looking. He carries, he's strong, he's tall. I mean, all these things are looking at him. Well, surely he, he's going to be a great leader as a king of our nation. The problem is, is that it's all external stuff. Saul, Saul had cosmopolitan, but he had no character. He had stature, but he had no substance. And everybody saw what was on the outside, and he was good looking, and he was a tall man, and he seemed to have his presence. Like, surely he's, uh, I, I can, it's so obvious why God has chosen him as our king. He looked good on the outside, but he didn't have the spirit of God on the inside. It isn't that how we all too often decide the worth of a man, the worth of a person. If you're tall or good looking, if you have money or material things, you must be doing really good, right? If you, some people looked at uh, those that have, seem to be having a lot of fun over the life of the party. 
Uh, or they seem to be really successful. They've gotten into good places in their life. They've done amazing things. Boy, everything's good. Right? But God doesn't care about any of those things. He wants to work in our hearts. He wants to work in your heart. Hebrews 2, uh, excuse me, 4, 12. It says, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to divide in soul and spirit, joint and marrow, it judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. See, we want everybody to be impressed by how we look, but God wants to know what's inside. And that's where He is taking care of His business. Though man looks at the outward appearance, God wants to deal with the matters of the heart. And so the problem is that we only let Him see the outside. We usually focus even on ourselves on the outside. We get all cleaned up to church. We try to look good, sound impressive. We throw in a good behavior here and there. Voila! The perfect Christian. <laughs> but our heart can still be so far from God. But we're still hiding baggage. It just doesn't work that way. You have to let God call you out of your baggage. You have to let Him get in your heart and do His work. You know, for nearly two weeks now, uh, actually nearly three weeks now, I think, my uncle has been in the hospital. Henry Peyton, many of you know him. Um, my uncle's been in the hospital, and he had a stroke that turned into a massive brain hemorrhage. Um, he's been progressing well. They've been doing certain regimens with him and tests. They've been giving him medicines. They did brain surgery to evacuate the excessive blood that was there and all these kinds of things. Now he's on therapies, and he's really improving. We're really excited and thankful, and a lot of prayers are lifted, and, and he's doing well. But he had a very serious, very scary medical problem. And so he went to the hospital to get the care that he needed. And now he's starting to improve. If you have baggage in your life, it cannot be, uh, it, it is going to cause spiritual hemorrhaging in your life. If you're carrying baggage, and if you're hiding behind your baggage, it is going to slowly consume who you are. And, there's, and the doctors can't fix this. There's no surgery to remove emotional pain. These are things that are only God's job. And we have to learn how to be in the habit of going to Him to ask for help. Remember, could have said, oh, I feel okay, I'll just get better. And He wouldn't be here today. How often do we live our lives with emotional baggage, with all kinds of problems, with, with all kinds of stressors and pains and emotional issues and spiritual issues? We think, and it's hemorrhaging in our life. We say, but I'll be okay. I think God has a plan for spiritual healing. We know He wants to bring healing. We've all had pain in our life. We've all made mistakes in our life. We've all had things happen to us. We've all done things wrong. And every one of these things just puts another piece of bag, uh, another article of some kind into our baggage. And it begins to, to fill us up and to weigh us down. But God has a plan to find spiritual healing. And I believe that that plan is found in James 5.16. It simply says this, confess your sins to each other, and pray for each other so that you may be healed. It's a very simple plan. It's a very simple process. The problem is, is few are willing to follow the plan. Few are willing to take the steps. There's only two of them. Number one, you just find a friend that you can share your failures and your struggles with. Share your mistakes, share what's going on, share the fears that you have, share the guilt that you feel or the shame, share the things that you've done wrong. Whatever's going on in your life, whatever your life is out of sorts from who God wants you to be, find a trusted friend that you can share that with. 
Where are your hurts, your habits, and your hang-ups, as they say? Where are the problem spots in your life? Dig through the baggage that you have and share that with somebody you trust. And the second thing is, begin praying about it. Pray that God will heal you from it. Pray that you can start letting it go. Pray that he would bring healing into your life. Pray that he would help you be the person he wants you to be. It is very, it's only very recently that I've discovered something. As I've been working with people and talking to people, and we would visit, and I would share wisdom, and we would look to scripture for what a person might do and, and all that it says. And, and then we would pray, and we would seek wisdom. And what I've what I begun doing different is, a, is another very small little shift. Is I've always, I, I've always uh, asked people, okay, you know, what do you want to do? What's your plan? Where, where are you going? Let's pray. Let's see God's leading in this. And now I've changed that well, my final question, and we pray first, and then I say, now, what do you think God wants you to do? What do you want to do is a very different question from what you think God wants you to do. Very different question. And so we begin praying through our back. We begin praying through the issues of our life. We begin praying, seeking how God would lead us. You see, I think sometimes we only know how to pray for the things we want God to do for us. God, I need a new job. God, heal Aunt Sally. And God, you know, help me find a way to get my car fixed. God, uh, and those are fine. But that is such a small portion of prayer. What about the prayer that says, God, help me come out of my name? Um, this is kind of a cute little saying I saw, I found, it just said, everyone come with baggage. It's true, we all have baggage, we all have packs, we all have things that are like, find someone who loves you enough to help you unpack. <laughs> <laughs> the biblical add-on, caveat, if you will, is find someone with God that will help you unpack. And it's a pretty simple thing. When's the last time you kind of bore your soul to a trusted person? A friend, a prayer partner, a mentor, a counselor, um, a, a, a prayer partner? When's the last time you were really honest? So this is what's going on. This is where I am. This is where I'm struggling, or this is where I want to go, or this is what I think God has shown me. Invite them to unpack that with you and then pray through it, seeking God's direction in your life. I, um, I pray that over the next few weeks you find first the courage to come back. I kind of thought, boy, I'm afraid. Some folks might think, whoa, this, one, this seems heavy, and I don't know if I'm ready to come out from behind the baggage. I might miss the next couple of weeks. It sounds easier. First, come back. The second, what does it look like for you to start digging through your baggage to find freedom that Jesus Christ promises to those who trust Him? We've talked about so many times you can be, you know, you should be doing your daily devotional time. You could be writing in a journal. Um, it is a part of God's plan to share your life with a trusted friend, frying spiritual healing. So there's work that you can be doing this next week. And we'll learn more about this. We're going to follow Saul a little bit more. If you know anything about Saul? He had no heart for God. And he was a horrible king for Israel. He never really came out from behind him. Would you like to live a more victorious life? Would you like to live a freer life? Would you like to live a more effective life? What if we were a church that was full of people that were living 
filled with the Spirit of God and serving Him unencumbered that baggage that so often hurts and destroys us and others around us. Let's pray. Father, we just give you thanks for this opportunity.